Pastor Justin here. I pray you guys have been blessed by worship so far. I want to definitely make sure we give a shout out to our dance team and Rochelle for all the great work she's done. She's really been intentional to make sure that we still have ministry through so many different ways in the midst of this season we've never seen before. Um, and so I'm grateful to Rochelle and to those who participated in our dance team in uh, the midst of all of this season that we're in right now. I want to give special emphasis as well, too, to our face masks. You guys heard them on the announcements, but we have church face masks that have something very simple on them. Simply say, I am somebody. And these face masks, I think, would be really, really great. They're $5. We'll have them available next Sunday during our drive-in service at Hope High School. And I pray you all will grab a hold of one and go around and communicate to the world that you definitely are somebody. And when you see somebody else who is somebody, you holler at a play when you see them in the street, right? Because you all are somebody. We're continuing the third leg of our series called... Um, a new normal and the series is catered to uh, really just all of us in terms of what it means to grab a hold of walking into a season we've never seen before being people we've had to really adjust to be adaptable um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm excited to continue the series the first week we talked about God giving my focus back about the challenge that God gives all of us to be intentional about focusing on our salvation to share our salvation the second time we talked engage with we talked about how God give me my courage back and that was last Sunday and in talking about God giving me my courage back, it was a challenge to all of us to ensure that we go into the world courageous, knowing that God has given us the courage to be who God's called us to be. And that whenever we shirk on being who we're supposed to be, who God's called us to be, we're shirking on the responsibility that God's given us, to, that God trusted us to be the people that God called us to be. And so now as we transition from really kind of in a theoretical outlook of all of this, I want to get into some more practical things, and that's the motions of First Peter itself. And so this week we're going to be bouncing around our Bible a little bit more than we have the other weeks, um, but I think that's absolutely fine. So make sure you have your Bibles, the Bible app, whatever it is. We're going to bounce around in some scriptures today to really see what God has to say to us. Um, so if you have your Bibles, um, let's jump right into it. First Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. It's a little windy out here. Oh, where am I? So I am downtown, actually. I'm downtown Providence, and I am, uh, I don't know where I exactly am, somewhere near the old Biltmore, um, but there's this beautiful artwork um, all around the corner and everything, and I thought it would be really cool to showcase the art of our people, the art of activism, how activism, how art can be utilized as a tool of activism, and how art, art can be utilized to communicate some beautiful things. And so this one in particular simply says, uh, better together, and I thought it was a great space to uh, wrestle with and to talk about who we are and, and, and what First Peter is actually challenging us to do. Um, if we're going to be better together, what does that really mean and, and all of that? So um, I thought this would be a great place to do it. Um, to take the gospel places we've never been before. I've been asked three times since I've been here just getting set up. What are we doing and how we're doing it? The first time I was like grunting. Second time I communicated to someone. Third time I just simply told them. Uh, and so I, I wonder who's going to bug us while we engage in this today, but I don't think it's bugging. I think it's God ordaining himself to walk past us to see what we communicate beyond these moments and make sure we communicate to the people we see. So um, yeah, let's have some fun today. First Peter chapter one, going down, sorry, first Peter chapter two, going down to verse number 11. This is the word of the Lord. Um, and it says this, dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires, which war against your soul. Live such lives among the pagans that when they accuse you of doing wrong, they see your good deeds and glorify God in the day he visits us. Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires, which war against your soul. Live such lives among the pagans that although they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Here's a prayer I want you to pray today as we continue this series about the new normal. The first week was God giving my focus back. The second week was God give me my courage back. This week, we're going to simply talk about God, remind me of my influence. God, remind me of my influence. Would you pray with me, God, today as we jump into your word? Let me see myself in your word. Let your word meet me where you need me to go. And let me do, God, what you need me to do to build the community you need to be built. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Keep your Bibles open. We're going to be all over our Bibles today. Um, let's jump into this. So here's what's going on in 1 Peter chapter 2. We've gotten out of chapter 1, where chapter 1 was really engaging with us in what it means to be holy because God is holy, right? That's 1 Peter chapter 1. We, we see here, we, we thank God for this. We saw the first time how God was challenging us to keep our focus on our salvation. Then the second time we got into this text, we saw under the end of the text, because of the, the lamb that was slain for us, because of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, that now God is challenging us to be courageous in all that we do and everywhere we go. Why? Because God is challenging us that we are holding on 
on to the Word of God, that we can be courageous in all that we do because we have the Word of God on our side. That was chapter 1. Chapter 2 begins the first 10 verses. He continues this journey and this narrative of what it means to be connected to the Father, connected to God, and then we get to this place in chapter 2, round verse number 11. And in chapter 2, round verse number 11, we get this transition from the th theory when it comes to what it means to be holy to the practice of what it means to be holy. They move from theologizing, from theorizing of what it means, to then the actual practice of what it means to be Christian, to what it means to be holy, and what it means to practice these things that God challenged us to do because of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now chapter 2, verse number 11, and here's what we begin to see in chapter 2, verse number 11, right? This practice, and here's, actually, before I even get into that, here's what I want to remind us of. It's one thing for us to know things about Jesus. It's another thing for us to practice the things we know about Jesus. I think we do a very good job of knowing things about Jesus, finding things out about Jesus. Think about the debates you're seeing online, the ways we're arguing online so much, right? It's things we know about God, things we know about Christian faith, things we know about Jesus. The, the, the challenge becomes the actual practice of what it means to be who God called us to be. And I get we live in a world where that practice gets challenged. I get we live in a time and space where that practice gets challenged, where um, the challenge of being a Christian, the challenge of walking into the world, the challenge of being who God's called us to be. But I want to challenge us to move from theorizing, theologizing, churchitizing Jesus, and practicing what God has called us to practice. And that's chapter 2 of 1 Peter. So look what the text says. Keep your Bibles open. Let's just literally, I want to break this text down. After we break this text down, I want to apply this text. But look at chapter 2, verse number 11. The first thing the text here tells us, number one, it says, dear friends. I want to pause here because here's the three things I want you to see how God calls us Christians in this text. Number one, he says, you are my friends. Another word there is you are the beloved of God. Because you are the beloved of God, he says, the first thing I want you to understand is your connection back to God. You are friends of God. That if we're going to practice this, the first thing God does is remind us of the relationship that we have with Jesus. And that is, first of all, you are friends of God. Beyond the friendship I have with God, then he says, dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world. What the text is trying to show us in this case is, remember, these are exilic people. They're, in, they're minorities in a community. They're not, they're not respected in a community. They're not engaged holistically in this community. And that's why God has planted them where they are. And so now he says, not only are you my friends, I'm looking at my relationship with God. But then he says, beyond you being my friends, you are aliens and strangers in the world. God is literally trying to communicate to them that because of that, you are different. You are set apart. You are not the same as the world. I want to communicate to all of us, because you have been connected to God, because you know God, because you have a relationship with God, you are an alien, a stranger in this world. You, you are someone who acts different and walks different. And if we ever get to a place where we're too much like the world, that's where God is trying to challenge us. I don't want you to get so consumed with being so acclimated to who we are in the world, but to bring the relationship you have with God to the places you go into. He says you are aliens, you are strangers in the world. And it's not a bad thing to be isolated. It's not a bad thing to be different from, different from the world because God is challenging us in this text and he's showing them, I don't want you to be isolated from the world. I don't want you to withdraw from the world because you're different. I want you to engage in the difference that you bring into the world. You hear me say this all the time. You are not different by desire. You are different by design. And because I'm designed differently, because you are designed differently, God is trusting you to bring yourself and God's self in every place and everything you do. He says, so look at the text. Verse number 11, he says, I'm calling you friend, dear friends. Um, dear friends, I urge you that you are aliens and strangers in the world. Look what it says, to abstain from se sinful desires. I want you to see here in this text, it's very interesting the way that God puts this in the text. He doesn't say, I want you to abstain from the practices of sin. It's the challenges to abstain from the desires of sin. The, the issue, church, is that it's not, the, the issue that happens in so many of us when it comes to sin is the, we talk about the action of sin, but it really starts with our desires. I'm desiring to do something that's contradictory to who Jesus is and who God is to me. And so the challenge we get there is that I'm now, I'm too caught up in the desire of sin. If I'm desiring sin, I then eventually will practice that sin. That comes along with so many different things. It starts with the, the root cause, the seed that has been sown. Can you imagine what would happen if you confronted the desire before it got to the activity? Like, think about it. Things don't just start when you do it. 
it starts when you thought about it, right? It, it starts when you begin to question whether or not you can do it, you can engage with it, whether or not you'll be able to get away with it. it, it the sinful desire in the text says, I want you to abstain from the desire. Because if you abstain from the desire, the act won't happen, right? If you abstain from the want, the act won't happen. So the question becomes, what are the things you really desire to do that you know can distance you from the Father? Right? And first Peter tells us here, first of all, I want you to abstain from the desires of sin. What are the things in your life that you desire to do? I want you to see this. What are the things you're engaging in that you you desire to do? What are the things? I, you know, I, I've been reading so much about Afrofuturism and Afro-pessimism, and it told this story that it talked about how we find characters in movies to emulate. Uh, we, that, that, that every single movie and movie genre that we have, there are certain characters and typecasts that we love engaging with because it reminds us e either of two things. One, it reminds us of who we are in the world, or it, it reminds us of what we desire we, 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 we desire to do, right? So there's certain characters and certain types of characters and certain actors and actresses we're drawn to because of what they do, right? Um, the same thing goes for sin because there's something that that actor is doing in a movie screen that I wish I could engage in. Church, those are desires. I want us to confront the desire, the desire to be against who God is, the desire to do things that are against what God is calling us to do. Church, it's not the act, it's the desire. It's, it, it, it's, 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 it's the ways that we create spaces to find ways to sin. It's the ways we schedule it. It's the ways we move around, the ways we lie to others. One lie begets another lie. And a church, I want you to check it because before it becomes an action, we check the desire. Before it becomes an action, we check the desires. So before I go to anywhere else in this text, what are some things in your life, in your body, in your mind, in your space that you are desiring to, that you know, if you ever were to fully engage in it, it could distance you from your relationship with Jesus? So that you would have to ask Jesus for forgiveness for what you are desiring to do. Let's kill the desire before it becomes an action. The text says here, dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires. Look what the text says, because they war against your souls. So look at verse number 12. So then live such good lives among the pagans that, that even though they accuse you of doing wrong, they see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits. Let's break this down. So when he says here, the pagans, this word Gentiles in the text, the, the word there is not the words we get, we sometimes use for non-Jews. What the text is trying to tell us is it's people who are not Christian. They're non-Christians. And it says, I want you to live such a good life among non-Christians that when they accuse you of doing something against the Father, they can't find any sort of basis for what you did against the Father. Um, it's not a non-Jew thing, and what it's trying to show us here is it exempts us from race, it exempts us from creed in this particular text, but it gets us to a place where we're really looking at our Christian faith. And what it tells us in this text is, listen, I want you to live such a good life, because here, the reason why this evil doers, this good deeds, this bad these deeds thing is such a big deal, is because Romans at the time were spreading rumors about Christians and calling Christians evil calling Christians against God, calling Christians against the community. And because they were calling Christians against God, against the community, because the Romans were doing this against the Christians, they were saying, listen, live in such a good way so that when the lies are told about you, they have no place to stand. Here's what I want to tell you and show you in the text. Being saved, being different in the world, being someone who's a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ means there are going to be times where you're going to be accused of doing something or engaging in something that frankly is not true. I want to be, make it very clear that when people see the success that God has given you, that the places where God is taking you, the things that God has done in your life, there will be times you will be accused of something that frankly isn't true. That's simply because that God has showered favor and mercy and peace on you, but there will be times you will be accused of doing things that you didn't do. And what the text says, I want you to live in such a good way, live in such a wise way, live in such a Jesus-following way, that when someone does accuse you of doing something that's against the Father, they can't find any sort of basis. The book of Isaiah says it like this, that when my enemies lied on me, my up integrity upheld me. I want to challenge you, church, on the good deeds you're doing. So what about this accusation? Before we fall, to the hateration movement, right? Because we love talking about haters. Everybody got haters. Everybody, for some reason, everybody hates you, right? Before we get into the hateration movement, can I can I show you something? Because what these accusations come in as is these accusations, and this goes as a two-way street for the people who do it and for us. These accusations show us that there's something about success. Um, there's something about your success, or something about somebody else's success 
that we have to figure out a way to justify why they have that success. Um, um, so therefore, I've got to put onto them what I would have done or what I think they probably did to get to where they are. Um, so when you see someone doing something or see someone successful, I've got to find some sort of reason to say that that individual, the only way they could have gotten to where they are, I'm going to accuse them of something because if I was in their shoes, I probably would have done the very thing I'm accusing them of doing. Um, if you don't believe me, the story of the prodigal son, the story of the prodigal son, the text says the brother, the one of the brothers went to the father and said, hey father, give me the, my inheritance, give me my riches. He goes down, he ends up in a pig pen. He gets into a pig pen. The text says he comes to himself, he comes back home to the father. When he gets to the father, the father was a big party. Oh, the brother comes out and says, father, why are you throwing a party for him? Don't you know what he did? He was engaged in riotous living. He was hanging out with prostitutes. He was in all this foolishness down in the country, far away from the country. Here's what I want you to notice in the text. We never see what the brother actually did. Don't miss this. We never actually see what the prodigal son did. All we know is that the older brother comes and says, when he was out there, he did this. Because what it shows us here, church, is that if the older brother had the riches the prodigal son had, he would have done the certain things, riotous living, prostitutes, selling himself, all that. All we know is the brother lost his money. We don't know how he lost his money. The grace of God doesn't tell us how he did it, which is a place for all of us to praise God. That God doesn't actually tell on you to anyone, but we see the sin that we wish we could. That's the issue we see in this world. There's so many things that people are judging others for because if I were you, this is how I would sin. This is how I would get there. You hear that all the time. The only way that people could have gotten to place, they had to be sleeping with somebody. They had to be knocking somebody over. They had to be selling something. They had to be embezzling because how in the world would you have the success you have if you weren't doing this sort of thing and so we accuse people of things that are not true because if I was in your shoes this is how I would get to this place of success I remember my first year pastoring church started growing things were going very well for us and I had somebody call me to the church sat down wanted to meet with me so bad I said what do you need to meet about came in they said pastor I heard you stole two hundred thousand dollars I said I did what I, I stole that I'm like I'm sitting here like I have student loans I'm wearing suits that are too big. Um, I, I got I got three good suits. I got shoes with holes in them. But I'm out here stealing. I'm like, please tell me one. How do you do that? I don't even know how to do that. Where do you do? Where do you put that stuff? So how do you even get that type of access to resources? And oh my God, if I had it, man, I'd be living so much better than the way I'm living. But the, really, the challenge there was, no. If you were in my position, this is what you would do. I had somebody else come to me. I never think it was like last year. And they came to me, and because of the pace and the work that we do and how quickly we move, came to me and said, Pastor, I'm coming to pray for you. I said, why? Um, because of your addiction to cocaine. I said, I'm, you're telling me something. I didn't even know about myself. I didn't know I was addicted to, to that. They said, no, there's no way you can work as hard as you work and do what you're doing unless you are, you are doing some sort of, you have to be. You have to be. So I'm going to come pray over you because you're addicted to it. I said, one, I don't even know who... I don't even know what this stuff looks like. I don't even know who to call to get it. I don't even, I don't even know how to find it. I don't want to find out to find it. And if y'all know, I'm praying for you. But I don't even know how to find it. I don't know where. But it was amazing because they put on to me that the only way you possibly could be the person you're doing is if you're, you're, you're doing this, you're doing that. And I think that happens to a lot of us. The text says it's going to happen. Can I give something to you? Elbow somebody around you. Tell them, get some tough skin. Get some thicker skin. Get some thicker skin. Because if you're doing good for the gospel, it's going to happen. But the text says, when they accuse you, live in such a manner that they have nothing to put on to you. And here's what the good news is. The reason they don't have anything to put on to you is because God is giving you the opportunity to then, at the end of the text, use that space, that platform he gives you to bring glory unto the Father. That God is giving you a chance to then turn that story all the way around and tell the story of the Lord Jesus Christ. The only reason I am where I am, the only reason I'm living the way I'm living, the only reason I'm owning the way I'm owning, the only reason my marriage is the way that it is, the only reason my children are the way that they are, is because of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I am who I am today because of Jesus. I will be who I am tomorrow because of Jesus. I will go where God is calling me to go because of Jesus. And you guys hear me say this all the time, but the only reason all of us are doing what we're doing, becoming who we're becoming, going where we're going and grooving the way we're grooving is because of the shed blood and redemption of the blood of Jesus Christ. I can give you a bunch of prosperity stuff. I can give you 10 steps to success. I can give you all this, but y'all, let me tell you something. Jesus, only Jesus. And our gospel teaches us that. Our lives teach us that. And that's what the text also shows us as well. The text says, listen, you 
will have times where you are accused for something. But God challenges us to be people of good deeds so much so that when that comes, God puts a platform in front of you where now you're able to glorify and bring power unto the Lord Jesus Christ over and against what your enemies, other people around you are trying to tell you so that you can be the agent to save their souls. What's all that mean, Pastor Justin? God has put and trusts all of us with influence. God trusts you with influence. He's trusting you with the ability to tell his story and have influence and success because of telling his story. God is trusting you with influence. He's trusting you with the ability to tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ, about the love of Christ, about the power of Christ, about the passion of Christ. God is trusting you with influence. 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 You have influence over your children. You have influence over the people that you lead. You have influence because of the titles that you have, the places that you've gone, the stories that you have. You have influence. And I want us to own that influence. And if we're going to practice what it means to be holy, we have to own the reality that God is trusting you as an influencer. And that's not always easy to hear. It's not, it's not fun stuff to always hear that God is trusting me with responsibility. Um, with multi-million dollar industries right now on social media and media and marketing are people that are influencers making really, really good money at 17 to go and influence people on as to what to buy and what to wear and what to drive. Influence is monetized. Influence is powerful. And church, as Christians, God trusts us with influence to tell the story about Jesus, to go into places where Jesus is in, and to engage with holistically in what Jesus is calling us to do in that moment. God, remind me of my influence. As we go into this new normal, as we go back into jobs, we go into our work, we go into spaces, church, I'm challenging you to own the influence that God has given you because you are saved and set apart. I want you to own the influence that God has laid on you because you are an alien, a stranger, in exile. You are wandering, but you are loved by God. I want you to own your influence, that the rooms that God is putting you in because God knows you have influence. The tables God is putting you at, God knows you have influence, but the challenge I want you to take hold of today is God remind you of my influence, kill my ego, so I don't think it's me with the influence, but I know it's you with the influence, and that God let me use this influence to change the world and to change a culture. So here's what influence is, and I want to define influence, it's going to come up on your screen. Influence is two things. Number one, influence, is, influence teaches people how to think. Influence, number one, it teaches people how to think. I'm going to, don't mishear that as manipulation because it's not. It teaches people how to think, right? Number two, influences challenge, challenge people to grow. It challenges people to grow. And I add this on to influence. It challenges people to grow beyond themselves. Influence teaches people how to think and it challenges people to grow beyond themselves. Now those two things combined to me come to this little itty bitty middle in this Venn diagram, if you will. And the itty bitty middle of the Venn diagram says this, I role model that behavior. That influence first calls me to be a role model of what I want others to think and how I'm going to challenge others to grow. If you're a parent, you have influence on your children. If you're a leader, you have influence on the people you lead. You have a, if you're your spouse, you're, you have influence over your on and with your significant other. Um, if you're working with people, you have influence the people you're around. You, you have influence. The titles you have, what's in front of your name or what's behind your name, you have influence. Those of you who are young, give influence over your peers. Some of you are leaders among your peers. You have influence and influence teaches people how to think challenges them to grow, but you have to role model that behavior. And frankly put, a lot of us don't like that middle part. I don't want to have to be a role model. Who am I to be the role model, to be the one that others are following behind, to be the ones that others are emulating, but God is showing you, you are an alien in the world. You are a stranger and God is trusting you to be a role model. So I want to challenge all of us today to own the influence that God has put on the inside of us because God says you have influence. So how do I do this? How do I own the influence that God put inside of me? I want, to ask, I want you to ask yourself some questions. Why don't you want to be that role model? What is it about you that you are telling yourself that disqualifies you from being the role model that God is calling you to be? What are the things in your past, the things in your story, the things in your present, the people you're afraid of to actually go out in front of and be the role model of a mother, the role model of a father, the role model of a student, the role model of a, of a husband, the role model of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a teacher, the role model of a leader. God is calling you to be a role model because you have influence and he's trusting you with the influence that God has given you. So how do we do this, Pastor Justin? How do we engage in this? I told you we're going to be in your Bibles. Really quickly, I want to show you three different scriptures on how I own my influence. First of all, turn to Psalm 119, verse number 65. Psalm 119, verse number 65. I want you to see this in Psalm 119, verse number 65. 
reason I want to go into scripture is I want to give you these three different principles, very simple, how to master, how to own your influence, how to recognize influence and own your influence. Before I get to life coaching, I want to show you scriptures today so you can you can judge this for yourself and come to your own conclusion. But the first thing text shows is number one, how I can own the influence inside of me. Number one, I follow something that's bigger than me. I follow something that's bigger than me. Psalm 119, verse number 65. Listen to the word of God. It says this. Do good to your servant according to your word, O Lord. Teach me knowledge and good judgment, for I believe in your commands. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. You are good, and what you do is good. Teach me your decrees. I follow something that's bigger than me. What the text is trying to show us here in this text, and what is showing us here, that if I'm following something bigger than me, the first thing is I'm following after the word of God. We live in this age and time, and I want to show you something. Here's my little analogy for the day. I think we're getting very good, y'all, because we're living in this age and time where this, our phones, are getting a little more important than this, our Bibles, right? And so we're getting really consumed with trying to manage and be because we, 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 our phones are getting a little bit bigger than our Bibles. And so what our phone says and what popularity says and what clout says and what others think about me, what others say about me, and I'm going to take more selfies and how others see me is becoming a little bit more important than my, my Bible. So how I figure out how to get back into the world is tripped out by my phone, not my Bible. How I figure out how to manage my marriage, my children, my life, my money is not being, is not being driven by my word, but is being driven by my phone. And what the text is trying to show us here is, listen, when I was led astray, when I was afflicted, I didn't go here. I went here. It's so easy to wake up in the morning and the first thing I do is check this instead of checking this. It's so easy to wake up in the morning and to find find myself into the pigeonhole of this. There was a, there's, an, there's an advertisement that Apple has out now about the Apple Watch that says we have a watch that tells you time and makes phone calls and is connected to satellite and has Wi-Fi and keep your health. You know why? Because it's much easier to fall into the trap of this than to fall into the trap of this. If you want to figure out how to transition back into the world, I know it sounds crazy because you want to talk about 10 steps of success and what blog to read on this, but can I tell you, if you want to figure out how to transition back into the world, I can tell you, Nehemiah can tell you the simple story of how they, after exile, this leader had to get up and lead an entire group of people back to build a wall, to build a community, to get back acclimated into the world, not because of this, but because of this. If you want to know how to get your children back into school, I can tell you right now, after a plague we see in the book of Exodus, when they had to lead all these families out we see parents and leaders joining together to be ensured that their children would be well, that a generation would be able to walk into the promise line, even if one generation didn't. It wasn't in this. It was in this. If you want to see how you can manage things and manage your health beyond pandemics and plagues, it, what's not in this? But I can show you the book of Ezra where the word of God is the guiding force. If you want to notice how, even how can you get back into the world and in the spite of everything that's going on, it's not going to be found in this. But I can tell you the story of Joshua where God told Joshua, be strong and courageous. Most Moses is dead, but I've ladled that on to you, church. Your future and your power will not come from this, but it'll come from this because I'm following something that's bigger than me. How much is the gospel guiding your decision making? How much is God's word coming out of your mouth to guide your decision making? It's a competition. The sad reality is we have this competition between social media and no, just being social with Jesus. We have this competition between knowing Christ and knowing my friends. The church, the first thing I want you to grab a hold of is following something that's bigger than you. Psalm 119 tells us that when I was led astray, I obeyed the gospel. I obeyed the truth. Who's guiding the way that you think? Who's crafting how you make decisions? Who, who's crafting your wisdom? Is it your phones or is it your gospel? Is it your coworkers or is it your gospels? Is it your friends or is it the gospel? First thing the text shows me, if I'm going to have influence, I'm following something that's bigger than me. The second thing the text shows me is I'm going to have influence. I, 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 I produce something that's worthwhile. Turn with me to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. I produce something that's worthwhile. Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6 gives us a story of the feeding of the 5,000 according to the gospel writer Mark. And as we see this story where they're coming together after Jesus is teaching them, go back up with me to verse number, chapter 6, around verse number 35. Listen to this. By this time it was late in the day, so the disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said. It's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But Jesus said, yes, you give them something to eat. They said to him, it would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go on and spend that much on bread and give them something to eat? Verse number 38. How much do you have? Go and see. When they found out, they said, we have five fish, five loaves and two fish. Jesus says, what do you 
have, that when I'm a follower of Christ, if I have influence, not only am I part following something bigger than me, but secondly, I produce something that's worthwhile. If Jesus were to ask you the question, what do you have? What is your response? I believe a lot of us, when Jesus asks us that question, we respond to him, what's wrong with us? We respond to him with what what we don't like about ourselves, others think about us, what we wish would go right in our lives. What do you have? Well, my mama said this, my friend said this, what do you have? This is what I don't have, this is what I wish I had. Jesus says, what do you have? Because what you have can provide something for the community that you're in. What do you have? You have ability to produce because here's the conundrum in the text. One of the conundrums in that text is that they were saying, let's go back into the community. Let's give something to the community because it was really easy for them to find a way to have some political correctness. It was really easy for them to say, let's go back into the community because if we go into the community, people that don't like you, Jesus, may like you because you want to give away to the community. And Jesus says, listen, I'm not trying to get people to love me. I'm not trying to get affirmation from the world. I want you to see what happens when we give what you have over to the Father. Jesus asked the disciples, before we try to become politically savvy and politically correct, what do you have? Church, what do you have? What do you have to give to a God that loves you? What do you have to give to a Jesus that sees you? What do you have? I think the challenge for a lot of us is to be intentional about giving Jesus what we have. Because we, we, we do a really good job in our prayer time of giving Jesus our worry. We do a really good job in our prayer time giving Jesus our fears, our anger, our anxiety. We do a really good job of that. But when's the last time you said, Jesus, here's my success. Here's my talent. Here's my gift. Here's my ability to connect people. Here's my ability to build community. Here's my ability to have influence. Here's my ability to be great. Here's my ability to connect with people, to know people. Jesus, here's the good stuff about me. And Jesus says, great, that's what I'm going to give to the Father. And he takes the bread and he blesses it and disperses it among the people. What do you have? What is Jesus calling you to produce with what you have? Church, if you're going to be a person of influence, what do you have? The crazy story for a lot of us is that you don't need God to give you something new to do something he's told you to do already. You don't need God to give you more time. You don't need God to give you more resources. You don't need God to give you more degrees. You have it, but you just keep giving Jesus the wrong thing. You keep telling Jesus to multiply your mess. You keep telling Jesus to multiply your insecurity, to multiply your worry. And Jesus says, no, what do you have? What loaves do you have? What talent do you have? What gift do you have? What possibility do you have? And if you give that to me, I will give it to the Father. We can do something amazing with it. If I'm going to be an influencer, I follow something bigger than me. I'm be an influencer, I would do something worthwhile. But thoroughly and finally, and I'm finished, I push for relationship. I push for relationship. Go with me to John chapter 14. Go with me to John chapter 14. I want you to see this. We've preached this text before, but I want you to see this this time in the same light, just reading it, taking it exactly for what it says, John chapter 14. And in John chapter 14, we see this conversation that Jesus is having on his last week with his disciples, and he comforts his disciples. And a lot of times we read this text at funerals. So I want you to see this when Jesus has a relationship with us. Look what it says. John chapter 14, verse number one. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, also trust in me, in my Father's house in many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, so you also may be where I am. You know the way, the place I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do not, you know him and have seen him. Verse number eight, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and that'll be enough. Look at Jesus' rebuke. Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who's seen the Father? How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am the Father and the Father's in me? The words I say are not just from my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. So believe me when I say, I am the Father and the Father's in me. Or at least believe the evidence of the miracles themselves. Philip says, Lord, show us the Father. Philip says, Lord, give me a shortcut. I get I get it. You want you are the way, the truth, and the light. Jesus, I get it. But just show us the Father. I, I need a, I need a shortcut. Jesus says, No, Philip. I want you to have relationship. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, Peter says, Give me a shortcut. Peter, Jesus says, No, I'm not giving you a shortcut. How is your relationship with Jesus? We we can spend so much time talking about building disciples, but I want to check disciples today. People that Jesus says has influence in the text here. We see an influencer who looks at Jesus and says, Father, I want a shortcut. How, uh, how is your relationship with Jesus? This is a pastor checking in with you today. How's your time with Jesus? How's your relationship with Jesus? If you were to say you and Jesus recording and together in a great relationship, how often are y'all dating? 
How often are y'all sitting down breaking coffee? When's the last time you checked in to see how he was doing? How often do you listen to what he says? Jesus says, there's no shortcuts in this relationship. If you're going to be an influencer, I need you not only, I need you not only to produce, I need you not only to follow up to something bigger, but I need you to have a relationship with me. To all of you who are listening to me, you may attend church often. How's your relationship with Jesus? You may, you may be talking to others, but how, how is your relationship? Is it healthy? Is it strong? Is it full of wisdom? Do you talk often? Do you listen? How is your relationship with Jesus? I remember when I was in school, I remember spending all this time with God. I'd get up early in the morning, y'all, and I would create this whole altar and space for Jesus. And we'd have coffee in the morning. I had a lexicon and two commentaries and a Bible out. I had all this, this deepness I would do. I'd spend 15 minutes do I spent 15 minutes getting set up, five minutes reading, go on to school, listen to some music, get to work, be cussing with my coworkers. I go play basketball, be cussing on the basketball court. Don't act like y'all don't do that. I leave out, you go to revival. And then, you know, after revival, there's the after revival party. So you go to the after revival party and people are looking more towards the party where the actual church service. And I would get home and realize I started my day preparing more than I did actually spending time with Jesus. Imagine if you do that with your spouse. Imagine if you do that with your children. If the only time you spent time with your children was preparing to spend time with them, but you next spend time with them. What if you switched up your routine with Jesus? What if you switched up your routine and you guys talked a little bit more, you engaged differently, you, you read a different translation of scripture, you read a different type of scripture, you read a different commentary, you read a different devotional, you, you prayed with different types of people. What would it look like for you to press for a stronger relationship with Jesus? Any married couple will tell you, man, every couple of months, you gotta switch some things up. You gotta change where y'all date, change how y'all date, change where you go. Any person who dates knows, man, that stuff gets boring if you do the same thing over and over and over. That routine gets so predictable and it gets so boring, church. I wanna challenge you, man, push your relationship with Jesus. Philip said, Jesus, we like you, but just give us a shortcut to the Father. Jesus said, no, I want you to see that the Father and me are one, have a relationship with me. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the light. What is that for you? If you're going to have influence, church, I need you to check your relationship with Christ. So where are you in your relationship with him? How strong is your relationship with him? How, 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 what can you do this week? Sorry, let me, let me feel like this. What did you do last week that you want to repeat this week? What didn't go well last week in your relationship with Christ that you want to eliminate this week? And what do you know you can add to strengthen your relationship with Jesus? Church, we're only as influential as the Jesus that puts us at the places to have influence. We can be great if we want to, but greatness, we can be good, but greatness comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. So we talk about better together. I bet you thought I was going to talk about race and all that today. We'll do that some other time because it's important for us and I want to be more intentional with that. But church, before we even get to talk about race and talk about all of that, I don't, I don't want to fall into the traps of, of hyper-churchitizing or hyper-spiritualizing that stuff. Listen, you and Jesus, when you have relationship, the two of you, the world, yeah, y'all will be better together, man. So I want to challenge you in your relationship with Jesus. So parents, what would your children say about your relationship with Christ? You know, my, my son's in this phase where he's starting to define who I am. And uh, he said to someone, we're at the store, and we were talking, and he said, my, my daddy is Pastor Lester, but he's Justin to me, right? I'm not Justin, but he said that, right? And it was funny because it made me think about, man, in 20 years, I don't want my son to call me and define me by the fact that I'm a pastor. I want to be defined as a Christ follower. So to all of our deacons, do your children define you as a deacon? Do they define you as a Christ follower? To our praise and worship leaders, do our, do your children, do your friends define you as a, a praise and worship singer or as a Christ follower? People find you as a member of a church or a Christ follower. D does your spouse know you study scripture and do they know what you're studying? Do your children know you study scripture? Your first place of influence is your home, then it extends elsewhere. So before we talk about co-workers and all that, do your, do your roommates know that you know Jesus? Push for relationship. Be an influencer. Craft language because God is trusting you with his story to tell his story into the world. Produce something. Have relationship. Be a part. Follow something bigger. And I guarantee your life will be so much different. You can walk into this new normal with influence. 
because of your relationship with Jesus. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. And I don't want you to think I'm beating you up right now, but I want you to really kind of look at yourself right now and ask this question, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? What is the Holy Spirit saying to you right now? What is he awakening inside of you? What is he, what, what is frustrating to you? What is angering to you? What is down to you? What about you are you frustrated with? Maybe God is challenging you in this moment to be stronger in your relationship with him, be wiser in your relationship with him. Where is it that God is designed to take you that your influence can even be influential in? That God says it first starts with a strong relationship with me. Normally I do call the discipleship for those who don't know Christ, but I want to do a call to discipleship today for those of you who do know Christ. It's one thing to be saved. It's another thing to then dive into what it means to be a disciple. So with your heart open, would you just pray this prayer with me? To all of my disciple, people who desire to be disciples, say, God, strengthen my walk with you. God, carve out time to be with you. And God, let me reflect you in the world. In Jesus' name.